The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings and welcome to this joint TCMI ASIST webinar. I am Anna Baptista, the chair of TCMI. It is my pleasure today to introduce the joint webinar series and today's presenter and topic. The joint TCMI ASIST webinars are presented as a service to members of TCMI and ASIST and to guests. The purpose of the joint series is to advance the discourse and practices of innovative metadata. This webinar will be presented by Joseph Bush, founder of Taxonomy Strategies, and hopefully Branka Kozovac, uh, Taxonomy Strategies Associate and Principal of Dotwit Consulting. Uh, Branka um, is having technical problems, so sh she is having technical problems to join the webinar. So if she can't make it, uh, Joseph Bush will do present your uh, webinar. The webinar will discuss a recent project which has established an internal library of technical resources as the International Save the Children charity, focusing on how this library has been aligned with external Save the Children's Resource Center. The webinar will describe how the project has reached consensus on how to accommodate and balance internal research and external communication requirements by developing a lightweight application profile. You will have an opportunity to ask the presenters questions near the close of the webinar. There is a panel on the right of your screen to enter the text of your questions. We ask that you wait to enter your text until near the end of the webinar. I will moderate the questions and answers. We will address as many questions as our time allows. With that, I'll turn the podium over to Joseph and hopefully Branka. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so this is Joseph Bush. And um, um, thank you, Anna, for the introduction. And as Anna mentioned, um, we did a dry run the other day. Everything worked well. But sometimes when we do the webinars, <laughs> we have some technical issues. So hopefully you can hear me OK. And hopefully Branka will join us in about um, 15 or 20 minutes, and she can talk a little bit about um, um, part of the uh, project that relates to working with SharePoint, um, since she is really a very good expert in that area. Um, as Anna said, um, Branka and I have uh, been working together. Uh, we work on various projects, but we uh, wanted to talk about the Save the Children project. We talked about this, and um, also um, uh, two of our colleagues from Sweden uh, came to the Dublin Core meeting in, in Copenhagen in um, 2016 um, when we first made this presentation. And um, we heard a lot about the Resource Center in that presentation, but um, because of the format of the panel, we, we didn't have so much time to really get into discussing issues related to the application profile and the design of the of a common metadata schema and, and mapping issues and, um, and and all of those things related to application profile so we thought it would be a good um, opportunity to um, use the webinar to go into more depth in some of these areas um, so we'll be providing some context at first um, that was originally prepared by Martin Svensson and Katie Conrad of Save the Children Sweden. Um, and we'll just be, to give you, the, you know, some context about this part of the project, um, but we'll be focusing in the second um, part of the presentation um, more on these uh, issues related to Dublin Core um, metadata. So, with that said, um, I want to give you a little bit of background on, um, on Save the Children Resource Center and how they arrived at a metadata scheme and value vocabulary. As Anna said, there's these two resources. This one is the public facing one and you can reach it on the web. We'll show the URL and also uh, show a brief um, uh, kind of video walkthrough of that website. But we encourage you to go look at it. It's a very good resource um, <clears throat> in this area and um, 
it, and, it, and it covers issues um, that Save the Children's uh, particularly interested in. We're gonna focus on nutrition and child health, but Save the Children also works on many other issues related to uh, children um, and advocacy for children around the world, particularly these days in situations related to refugees. And you can get a lot of this information on the um, Resource Center site. So it's, um, it's um, quite a well-used site. Um, in 2016, they had over 21,000, um, almost 22,000 visitors. Um, that number is probably at least five to 6,000 more. Um, and there's a little bit of information about the reach of the website. So Save the Children is international. They have affiliated organizations in many countries um, around the world um, and also an international organization. So it's kind of a um, collaborative network of, of projects. Each of these national groups um, is, is uh, independent and has their own um, project uh, focuses and, um, and programs, and the international um, coordinates these. So this is uh, one way that there's a common uh, presentation of information from across all of these affiliated organizations uh, related to Save the Children around the world. Um, so um, uh, this is the homepage from the Resource Center, and I'm going to um, um, now just run um, a short uh, video. It's a little bit less than five minutes that gives you kind of a, a quick overview of this particular um, uh, resource. Um, but <clears throat> just to point to you some of the things we're going to be focusing on um, are these key ways that information in the site has been um, has been categorized um, by by thematic area, by geography, um, by the creator and publisher, and also by some by some subject um, keywords. And then we'll show how that uh, works in the creation side when we're building a technical library more for uh, subject matter experts and how these can be allied. So let me just um, switch over to the uh, to the video.
Okay, so um, very briefly in the beginning of that video, um, there was mention of an API to allow for connections between um, a, the uh, creation of the content, which happens at the at the um, national organizations and this resource center, which is happening kind of as a centralized activity. So um, the important point here is that the, the resources that appear in that website, while they look all very uniform, actually come from many different sources. And presently, the, there's a um, individual, Katie Conrad, who is the, um, the metadata librarian. And a lot of her job is to um, basically take that incoming content and to um, um, harmonize and normalize the metadata that uh, comes with that and if there is no metadata to create the metadata so you know kind of the activity that a, a typical metadata librarian might might uh, might do so when she um, mentions the kinds of things that she would discover are metadata strings that are just not readable um, uh, text fields that are they're unsearchable um, lots of different ways that people would be categorizing um, the content. And what they want to do is to uh, create consistent metadata so it can be consumed and uh, by the Apache Solar uh, search engine, which is the Lucene based search engine that provides that guided navigation and filters that look so, that were so nicely, um, that works so nicely on the website and are shown in that video. So without that work to Clean the metadata. There's, um, uh, it's very difficult to have a nice, consistent experience like what we saw. Um, so um, for the content management, they're using Drupal, um, so open source content management system, um, and um, you know that's the environment in which she's working to build and and, and manage the the, <clears throat> the metadata for this uh, for the resource <clears throat> library and. A lot of what she's doing is trying to make more consistent the subject metadata, um, which um, covers a couple of different um, areas in, in this particular repository. And that's the thematic areas, the areas of the programs, and also things like geography. So you saw that really nice um, geography interface where you, where you move your mouse around on the screen and look countries are highlighted. Well, that only works if every content item gets the geograph the appropriate geographical uh, metadata and that that relates to either where the um, where the work is going on that's covered in the report or what the origin of that information uh, is. Um, so um, examples of the kinds of problems that she encountered were 18 different ways to spell Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire um, and issues about deciding um, um, what should be a country and what's a region, and that may seem like a small a small thing, but it's a big deal in this international organization. It's something that we um, had to do some work on as well, um, and um, and also making distinctions between um, countries as locations, as countries as uh, political uh, jurisdictions. So um, she does has done an enormous amount of work in. Um, being the steward of these reports and the metadata. And the result of all of that good work um, means that the user experience is really good and people come to the site and find it useful um, and, and, and come back. So it's been very successful and, um, and she <laughs> continues to work, uh, to work there. She's an American um, person with a library background um, and lives in, in Stockholm and works for Save the Children there. Um, and perhaps you'll run into her. She's somebody I think who will see ar around who's uh, gotten involved in the community. Um, so the next thing we wanted to talk about is um, uh, is the Save the Children Health and Nutrition Resource Library, which is the project that we worked on. Um, so um, I'm just going to do a check here to see do do we know if Bronca has managed to um, log on to Yes, I fantastic. <laughs> then, <laughs> then uh, we should switch to her computer so that she can show us um, her screen, and she'll walk through the um, the health and nutrition resource library. Can okay, so you should be able to see my screen now. Yes. 
Okay. Oops. Oops. <laughs> It didn't work. Um, yeah, so as uh, Joseph already mentioned, uh, Save the Children is an umbrella organization that has uh, some 28 national members and has operations and offices uh, in 120 countries, uh, in addition to uh, Save the Children International. Um, and as such, it is very decentralized with very little knowledge information sharing across its across the organization. Um, so some major uh, national members have their own intranets, uh, some minor ones share information on their shared drives or store it on their local computers, um, which of course means lots of time wasted for searching uh, or recreating information as well as training new stuff or even working with incomplete information. Uh, and that lack of sharing is of course um, especially harmful in such an environment uh, given the importance of the work that these people are doing. Um, and how valuable uh, every dollar saved and how precious every minute of their time uh, might be. Uh, so at about the same time uh, that uh, Save the Children Sweden uh, was working on developing their resource center, uh, health and nutrition uh, team in Save the Children US uh, started envisioning a resource library to be shared across all the members and working with Save the Children uh, International on developing um, and deploying it. Uh, and they were deploying it on uh, one net, uh, which is uh, their shared intranet that can be accessed uh, and also extranet that can be accessed but all their uh, employees uh, and contractors and that's where when they engaged uh, taxonomy strategies and Joseph and I came uh, to help them define that uh, library design it and make content on it um, more easy to find. Uh, so what we did, we came and we spoke to lots of people there, we interviewed them, we had a survey uh, to understand their needs and during that uh, interviewing process we also tried to learn about all possible, uh, all existing uh, libraries and to collect their metadata schemas which we later mapped and merged uh, and uh, we developed a draft application profile for their needs using Dublin Core as a reference uh, which we validated by steering committee and then further refined with the project team. Uh, and similar we did with, for their value voc vocabularies where we collected values from the existing libraries and parsed all available sources from search logs, uh, interview transcripts, uh, external web content from the same domain, developed draft vocab vocabularies, validated them through some the card sorting exercises uh, and validated more technical one with their uh, subject matter experts. Uh, and of course we faced some challenges along the way. Uh, one of them was um, balancing the needs of people who use and need to access the content and those who are creating and uploading it. Um, so uh, and that's natural because their uh, end users of their content are very diverse. They include very technical experts also, as well as uh, fundraisers, admin staff, uh, new employees, people working in very different situations on different devices uh, with different needs and paths for navigating content and in general such diversity requires uh, very rich metadata and lots of metadata elements which on the other hand represents a burden to people who are uploading content because there are no dedicated resources for uh, uh, for tagging that content and people on the field, you know, 
probably don't have a better use of their time than to add um, dozens of metadata elements to every piece of content they need. And again, uh, there was a problem bridging uh, uh, terminology uh, of those diverse users uh, uh, and also literary, organizational and user warrant. Uh, some people are very te technical and talk about F100, which doesn't mean anything to uh, more general users who would rather see it as a milk formula for severe malnutrition and so on and also managing changes over time because uh, uh, you know their priorities focus and uh, terminology change over time uh, significantly uh, which does affect uh, metadata labels and metadata values that that you are uh, that you are using um, so here is the onenet uh, health and nutrition resource library profile that we ended up developing um, and uh, I didn't mention that uh, this onenet uh, is developed on the SharePoint platform and you may know that uh, SharePoint uh, includes Dublin Core metadata fields. However, uh, we ended up reusing very few of them. Uh, first, because um, they are of different data type from what we need. Uh, for example, in SharePoint, you would have subject um, as free text and uh, say the children wanted those values to be controlled or you have uh, a list of languages as a choice that uh, that is not exactly uh, matching what their needs are they needed a, a different set of values different form uh, and wanted to manage them centrally so that they can be reused uh, and there were also some uh, some built-in content type that were uh, like created on uh, that were not exactly uh, what is meant by Dublin Core date created created date so there was uh, some need for duplication and not to mention that some of the labels of Dublin Core elements were not uh, really meaningful to um, to save the children users so we had uh, to change uh, label for coverage metadata element uh, for example uh, and uh, we actually wanted wanted also to align that uh, with the resource center because we found it uh, that uh, some of that content would be is very valuable for broader audiences and wanted to make it available for them uh, and we also wanted to streamline the process of collecting and publishing content and to uh, rationalize uh, tagging and the editorial efforts uh, across those uh, different teams. So at this time I will uh, uh, just mention um, what those differences between uh, two, uh, uh, two portals are that made our uh, <clears throat> task challenging and Joseph will talk later about how uh, we dealt with that. Uh, so, uh, first of all, internal and external audiences are very diff uh, different, uh, while internal ones tend to be more technical and to use internal jargon. Uh, external audiences are much more diverse uh, and uh, you don't know what language they are going to use. It is much more difficult to uh, to reach them. Uh, so, and they can also uh, 
cannot get training that you can provide to uh, internal audiences that would help them uh, navigate your content. Uh, in addition, while uh, Resource Center had a dedicated curator of that content, professional uh, <clears throat> A librarian who uh, was tagging content uh, in uh, health and nutrition resource library. Uh, it was users who were uploading content. Uh, also, content scope was very different. Uh, while a resource center has content uh, related to just uh, thematic subject areas, uh, internal library. Uh, includes content uh, that supports work processes and only a small part of that uh, is what can get get published externally. Uh, uh, also should mention that th there are technology constraints, differences between SharePoint and Drupal that they were using uh, that we had to account for when uh, developing our schemas and uh, vocabularies. For example, in SharePoint, you cannot put Russia under both uh, Europe and Asia, which you can do in Drupal, uh, while uh, Drupal didn't have a possibility to expand uh, with synonyms in search or type ahead uh, for uh, but it does have type ahead for uh, that looks up metadata values in the user interface. Um, and also, uh, we didn't work on the same timeline. Uh, uh, resource Center had dedicated resources and it was very fast paced uh, while uh, uh, resource library was very slow paced. We had some uh, delays and no dedicated resources, so we are lagging um, after them. Uh, and also, both started from a small subject area with the intention to expand it in the future. Uh, resource centers that started from child poverty and our library from health and nutrition, both with intention. Uh, to expand to all thematic areas in the future. Uh, and now I am passing it back to uh, Joseph, who will talk about uh, what exactly we did. Okay, thank you, Branka. I am so glad you made it. <laughs> so you could uh, go over those details more better than I could. So. Um, yeah, so as Branka said, um, really trying to explain a little bit more about the two different environments, um, the differences between um, an internal SharePoint-based technical um, resource that would have some materials that would be appropriate to publish versus the, the resource center, um, which was very publicly focused. So, um, and, um, you know, and as she you know, kind of implies what we needed to do is to uh, come to some alignment between these two very different um, approaches to um, describing um, and using um, and, and creating uh, content resources. So um, um, we think this is a, a great example of, a, a, you know, kind of a, a case study uh, for um, uh, application profile. So, um, you know, as you said before, um, the, um, uh, the, the OneNet Health and Nutrition Resource Library um, was intended to be a centralized resource um, that um, would integrate content um, available on, um, uh, in, in each of the members. So it, it did have this global reach, but it was internal. Um, and it was being designed initially with the intention um, to be extensible to other areas. Um, let's see, looks like these slides are very similar. I, I know why, that's because I'm just back to where we left off. Okay, here we go. So I want to talk about what is a lightweight uh, application profile and how we applied it. So, so first, a little bit of level setting about application profile. Um, it's a concept in Dublin Core, but it's actually a very good and useful concept in general for uh, information management um, projects. It's basically 
um, you know, deciding what is going to be your, your element set. Um, and, um, and instead of inventing uh, your element set each time from scratch, um, looking for what might be available, particularly um, when it's standard. So Bronca mentioned that um, um, Microsoft SharePoint has the Dublin Core metadata element set as a standard namespace, a standard set of metadata fields that are available within, within SharePoint. And you can adopt those rather than making them up. Of course, what often happens is that you need to um, is to, to need to customize those or optimize those for a particular local application. So this seems like a very um, kind of basic principle, but it is something that actually emerged in the Dublin Core community. And Rachel Heary in particular is the person who is uh, frequently mentioned um, uh, as being, you know, the person who popularized this um, this idea and described this idea of application profile. She's was a long a long term a long time an early Dublin Core uh, person uh, who sadly is not, not with us anymore. Um, so um, what we find is that we frequently approach um, our uh, projects with this idea. We're constantly um, you know, looking for ways that we can avoid creating things from scratch. We want to beg, borrow, and steal um, uh, whatever we can um, that we know works. And the more that it is uh, widely adopted, the um, more and easier it is for us to um, to rationalize, justify, train, um, and um, validate uh, uh, an approach to description. So by lightweight, we mean that the specification um, doesn't necessarily need to operate in a fully automated um, uh, way. And something that we forget about Dublin Core and other uh, standards is that they're primarily designed to enable the interchange of information between systems without the intervention of, um, of people um, so that we can have a predictable set of um, source content and a particular target and be able to um, map these with a high level of reliability so that we don't need to have quality assurance or other types of um, interventions by, by people. However, um, we don't always need to be able to do that. Sometimes we have a situation where there are intermediaries, where there are uh, people involved in the loop. And for example, as we described here, the resource center has a dedicated resource whose job it is to um, provide those, um, that, that, that sort of uh, uh, curation and correction um, process. So we don't have to necessarily um, fully implement a, a highly automated method, but we do want to move towards making it as simple as possible to enable this. Um, and often lightweight is a roadmap, meaning that we might start with a simple uh, implementation that might, uh, let's say, identify content that as we're uh, processing it for publication or communication to another source, um, but not necessarily have to fully automate that. It could be done in a batch mode. What we want to do is have a workflow process where we can capture information that's going to allow us to do things further down, down the road. In other words, we can have a bit of automation and then further automation uh, later on. So and that's what we were trying to do here. So um, the other thing I really like about the application profile model is that it is based on good um, systems development practices. Uh, the first thing you do is think about what are we trying to accomplish? What are the functional requirements that are needed, in this case, to provide public access to uh, content that's being built in this um, very geeky technical SharePoint environment, the Health and Nutrition Resource Library? Um, so our, our big use case um, or requirement is to be able to upload to this uh, public uh, resource center for public access from this internal um, um, uh, SharePoint library. So we need to be easily identify items for public distribution. In other words, as we're uploading them, we want to make a decision if possible. Is this something that we also would like to um, make available for public distribution in addition to having it in this internal technical library for, uh, for experts in health and nutrition? Um, uh, another, the second requirement was that is, this was going to be a batch um, process. It was going to be asynchronous. So periodically, we would push content to the resource center or pull um, 
uh, content from the Health and Nutrition Resource Library um, that had been identified and that had useful, quote unquote, metadata. Um, so how do we get that useful metadata? We want to be able to map um, the Health and Nutrition Resource Library metadata properties to those in the resource center so that um, we could extract those and perhaps relabel them. And uh, so those would be the containers um, for the metadata. And then we would also want to be able to um, map um, the values that populate the Health and Nutrition Resource Library metadata properties to values that are in the resource center if they're not the same and if they are mappable. Um, we want to then be able to do a few things to um, let our uh, people know what's going on. We want to notify the content owner when an item has gone live onto the resource center site. Um, too often we set these processes up and there's no feedback loop. So people don't realize that, you know, they've marked something, for example, to be published and then um, don't get notified when it is published. That's not a good way to encourage people to identify items to be published. It's really helpful and a very good practice to let them know. And that reinforces and encourages them to participate in the process and mark content to be published. Um, well, the next requirement is that we want to also identify items that are obsolete and should be removed from the public site. So you want to be sure that you have a round trip life cycle, if at all possible, so that not, you're not just publishing things, but you also want to remove things when they're redundant, obsolete, or trivial. And then finally, you want to communicate and confirm when something's been removed um, from that site. So again, having this feedback loop where you engage the content creators from the point where they've selected and decided to publish something throughout its life cycle, uh, particularly because it's going to be on another resource. And um, this is the best way to reinforce the behavior to participate in this publication uh, cycle. Okay, so that's a set of functional requirements, an important and basic first step when you're building an application profile. Um, the next step is to, um, is to um, describe the, the public access domain model. Um, and this is um, simply thinking through and understanding you know, what the metadata is that's going to be included in this public access domain model. So this is identifying um, you know, those properties which are going to become part of the metadata schema that's going to be moved from the internal library, in this case, to the public library. But um, uh, there could be other, other scenarios, but this is um, the next step. So take those functional requirements and consider you know, what do we need to have? What metadata do we need? Um, and, it, and to support those functional requirements. So for example, um, for those, uh, many of those requirements are what we might call business requirements, um, where we need to identify something for public distribution. So the second metadata uh, property, public distribution property, is um, really important to describe here. Um, and the owner, so that the owner can be notified when that item has been distributed or when it is going to be obsoleted. Um, and um, we had a few other um, uh, elements that were um, defined um, because there were some special cases that went beyond those broad um, categories. For example, the, the, the identifying something is uh, to be archived. So when we remove it, um, we want to put it someplace so that it's still available, but not going to be part of the primary um, uh, library. For example, it might be excluded from search or could be excluded from search. Or in some cases, there might be an item that is intended for limited distribution, not for distribution to everybody. And you want to be able to identify that. And the other attributes provide other types of functionality. But I wanted to point out the business metadata, which is driving particularly some of those use cases. Um, right. So. The, the, um, the next part of an application profile is to, um, is to take that kind of conceptual model of the relationships between those properties that we've identified in a functional way and to put them into more of a, um, of a specification or schema. Um, so where are the terms, um, uh, uh, what is the namespace that we're going to be using? Um, so, um, uh, and Bronca mentioned this, um, this before, um, so we're using the DC um, namespace as much as possible for this particular um, um, uh, um, activity because we're moving content from one um, environment to another. And even though we may not be uh, strictly using that namespace inside of 
the share point when we're doing this transformation between um, the um, Health and Nutrition Library and the Resource Center, we want to um, uh, you much more closely to aligning with the standard um, and to um, basically take that differentiation that's important in the Health and Nutrition Library and, um, and um, make it a more normalized um, view. One exception um, was the uh, identification of a uh, property which is unique to the Save the Children, and that's this notion of theme. Um, so um, you saw it in the user interface for the Health and Nutrition Library, you see it in the user interface for the Resource Center, and it's basically a, a specialized subject, if you will, that identifies these big areas of work, basically programmatic areas that Save the Children has agreed to uh, label um, across their uh, organizations. So there, there are things that are called theme sub-themes and cross-cutting themes, um, and we want to, um, again, make those a little bit simpler, um, just call them theme, but also um, make them particular to Save the Children because they're, they're not just any subject, they're a specific Save the Children set of categories that are um, negotiated and maintained by the organization. So we've called that out as a separate unique property that's owned and maintained as an in independent namespace by Save the Children. <clears throat> um, there's a, um, a, a, a bit more specification um, that we need to do in terms of range value strings and um, whether it's, um, uh, uh, I forget, uh, SES versus VES uh, URIs. So are we doing structural URIs or are we doing um, uh, string-based or value-based URIs? Um, these are a, a little bit more specific and technical, um, but let's just say this is the form for the specification for the actual namespace um, following the uh, guidelines for development of application profiles. Um, and um, uh, you know, to make this a little bit more specific, um, uh, we, in the context of application profile, we've actually taken health and nutrition resource library properties and aligned them with the resource center properties. And as you can see, there are a subset of properties, but they're the ones that are, the, in this case, the key access points. And there are some differences, for example, it's called region slash country and in the health and nutrition library, but country and region and the resource center properties. Um, as Branka mentioned, um, um, what uh, the health and nutrition resource library calls content categories are, um, or types or content types um, in Dublin core speak and, and, and so on. And these are also important to identify as areas where we need to do additional work on the value of vocabularies. And, we kind of call these challenges. Um, so we have to reconcile uh, things like um, thematic areas um, in the health and nutrition resource library, which are very focused on health and nutrition, and those which appear in the resource center. And they're not exactly the same, but they're close. So these are things that we need to reconcile. And what you see is um, what these vocabularies look like in a SharePoint environment. and and what they look like, at least from a user perspective, um, when they're published in the Drupal environment um, in the uh, resource center. Um, a second area of challenge was reconciling geographic regions. In other words, what, uh, and uh, Branka mentioned, we can't do polyhierarchy in uh, SharePoint. It's just not supported um, without doing um, tricks and things. Um, so we have some issues about, um, how we're going to organize these. So one solution is to say, look, we're just not going to do it. We're just going to have a flat list um, uh, or a single um, a hierarchy in the Health and Nutrition Resource Library, and we'll leave it to the Resource Center to be responsible for um, which uh, regions those countries go into. We don't need to make those relationships. They're made in the Resource Center, and we'll delegate to the Resource Center the um, the um, the uh, 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 enumeration of the poly hierarchy when that's uh, appropriate. Um, and then the final challenge is one that's very common and that's that we have these topics in the health and nutrition resource library and we have keywords in the resource center. In this case, actually, the resource center has a looser, um, less formal approach to 
um, to describing a uh, subject and the health and nutrition resource library has a more kind of technical focused uh, uh, effort in this area. It's something we spent a fair amount of time on in our project trying to reach consensus around a common set of topics in this area that could be agreed upon by the subject matter experts. Um, so this is probably the biggest challenge. One solution is to say, um, okay, uh, we're dealing with a keyword environment. Uh, whatever we have in the Health and Nutrition Resource Library will just be added to those keywords. What we lose is the mapping. Um, a more um, elegant and useful approach would be to actually do mapping between them. In this case, probably mapping keywords to the HNRL topics because those are um, uh, actually curated more than the ones in the uh, the resource center, but this is a typical kind of challenge. So I guess the point I'm trying to make in summary is that um, we can define a way to share um, metadata between these two applications, and that's relatively straightforward. Um, but there's a lot of work that gets involved in trying to harmonize the actual values that are being used, and that's a lot more difficult. Nevertheless, it doesn't mean that we can't easily move information from one to the other and provide a level of access. Um, but providing full integration um, would require a great deal more work, particularly in the area of subject. Okay, um, that's um, what we've got for you today. We wanted to um, kind of give you some background on the Resource um, Center um, as a public distribution form. Uh, then we uh, talked about some of the details of SharePoint and how to create schemas within SharePoint, and then looked at application profiles and how we could rec use that methodology um, to reconcile these two and identify some of the challenges that are faced um, and how to overcome them. So we'll leave it there and open it to questions. Okay, so um, first, uh, thank you, Joseph and Branka. Branka, I'm very glad you <laughs> made it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, the the space is open for questions. If uh, I'm now talking to the attendees, if you wish to uh, put a question, please don't hesitate. Um, in the meantime, uh, while I'm waiting for some questions to come up, um, I will um, ask you uh, some things. Um, uh, first, it is, uh, uh, well, I was in Copenhagen and I liked very much this project. Uh, it is uh, uh, for, for someone that works with application profiles and, you know, metadata schemas and vocabularies. Uh, it is, uh, uh, it is a, a, a nice, a nice uh, uh, implementation of, you know, uh, best practices of what what we how we like to do things so uh, it is i uh, congratulate you for your uh, for for this uh, uh, so nice project um and and now uh, i will would like to ask you some questions is uh, um the data the data that uh, that you create uh, is the data open or is it only used inside uh, the Save for uh, uh, Save the Children organization? Um, so um, that's a good question. Um, so I think that you can see in the Resource Center, this Resource Center is pretty transparent, <clears throat> um, at least in terms of the public metadata. But for example, the, some of the things we talked about, I mentioned it, I think I called it out as business metadata, but really it was where we were marking content status. So that, for example, um, to indicate when a content item was identified as appropriate for uh, publishing to the Resource Center, that is not um, transparent. So uh, strictly speaking, the metadata, um, the, sub the sort of the subject or access metadata on the resource center is quite transparent. Um, now, for those who use the uh, uh, health and nutrition library in its native form in the SharePoint environment, all of that is transparent to them. Um, and um, um, one could argue how easy it is to, 
to use it, but it's very transparent and very readily uh, you know, available to see as columns um, in, in um, any number of the, sh the ways that you can view um, SharePoint. Branka, do you wanna say anything more about that within the... Uh, yeah, I, um, I also wanted to mention the differences in the dates and the problems we, we had with the dates. I don't know if your question was referring to that as well, uh, because in, uh, in SharePoint you have that created date that is built in that actually uh, refers to the date when um, when the file was uploaded uh, to SharePoint, which is not necessarily the same date that is of interest to users. Uh, for example, in the Resource Center, you have all those reports uh, and projects, and the year is important there, which is also uh, what matters to uh, uh, internal health and uh, nutrition uh, library users. Uh, so we had to create a new element to uh, match those uh, those needs, uh, and we also needed to um, to be more specific at, to have a month and the day um, in um, in the internal resource. Uh, you can see uh, publication year is displayed to end users in search results in the resource center. Uh, I don't know if you tried to uh, to search that resource center and uh, see that it is also available as a refiner um, and in search results uh, display. There we also had to, uh, because internally we were working with um, with date data type, uh, which requires you to have month and day. Uh, we also have to come up with some rules how to uh, handle uh, the content items that didn't have that date specified so we you know decided to go with the last day of the month or uh, or uh, Jay's, uh, Joseph might know exactly what we what we did there <laughs> does that answer your question yes thank you um, uh, I am uh, we have an, a question here, but I, before I put that question, just just one more question to uh, just to make sure I understood well. If um, if uh, I want to pick that data, the data, the metadata, all the metadata that you have, and use it in uh, imagine that I'm developing an, an application that uses metadata from several sources. Will I be you? Will I be able to use uh, your metadata? Is it open for anybody to use? So I think what I would what I would suggest is you, if you wanted the metadata, is to contact Katie Conrad um, at the research center, and she would be able to answer the question. I don't know the answer, um, but uh, my guess is that um, assuming that um, it could be readily ex extracted, that that she would, um, you know, could facilitate that because um, that content is, um, you know, publicly accessible, and I don't see any reason why they would not um, want to or be willing to share the metadata. On the other hand, the Health and Nutrition Resource Research, Resource Library, which is an internal um, resource, um, while we also know it could be possible to extract the metadata, I'm pretty sure that they that that's not uh, publicly available and that they wouldn't make it publicly available because it's an internal resource. But I think the resource center is um, quite, uh, is fair game and, and we, what we need to ask Katie about the policy and, and the feasibility to do that. It's, so the answer is it's not uh, readily available. You can't go to the site and click an option and have it downloaded. You'd, you'd have to uh, work with Katie. Okay, thank you, Joseph. Um, we have a question here from um, from Daniel Lovins. 
He's asking, was there a particular tool used for extracting, trans transforming per map and loading into the resource center? Um, there's current there. It's currently um, not being done. Um, um, uh, there is no API that's been that's been written to do that. Um, you know that. Um, so it's a this is um, if you will a specification for the development of such a um, tool, but the tool in fact doesn't exist presently. Um, it's a project to create it, um, but we think that it's um, fairly straightforward to do that. Um, I don't know, Bronca, do you know, are there any existing tools for, let's say, extracting um, um, you know, metadata from a SharePoint environment um, and formatting it just, uh, just as a CSV file that could be brought into Drupal? I mean, I think that's, there's yeah, yeah. such tools. Uh, it can be easily done, but uh, there is no direct uh, export import currently uh, for that. It can be easily done, but it is not, you know, <laughs> uh, direct export uh, into a format that is easily importable to Drupal or other system. Yeah, so I mean, to answer Daniel's question directly, so mm -hmm. this is, what we've described here is, if you will, a specification. Um, it's an application profile, um, like any other one, and it, which is really just a specification that um, could then be um, could be created. In this case, the, it hasn't been created yet. It's still being done as an item by item um, kind of export. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I asked this attendee, Daniel Lovins, if you have uh, if uh, uh, the question, if you have any more uh, doubts on this uh, question, please please say uh, something. Um, we don't have so far. We don't have uh, more questions. So um, I would just add something that is, uh, as far as I understood, you have been having wonderful results, 150% increase in visitors or 150% of visitors uh, comparing to last year. So you are, <laughs> the results are very nice. Um, do you have any written material on this? Did you write more about this? Can we consult any more, you know, articles or uh, any documents? Um, good, good question. Um, no, we have not. Um, um, it, uh, again, um, I um, I met up with Katie uh, just um, last month and at a conference in Washington D.C. And I know she's um, you know still working on this, and um, also been in contact with the uh, people at. Um, Save the Children U.S. who are also in Washington and they they also have hired a um, uh, kind of a metadata uh, uh, person um, although she's not a librarian she's a, a nutrition policy person um, but who's focusing on this um, but we haven't you know uh, written up more details but um, um, we we should So uh, it looks like we don't have any more questions. Uh, we we are waiting for your for your written materials, <laughs> Joseph and Branka, because this is a very nice project. So um, I would like, um, on behalf of TCMI, I would like to thank you both for uh, doing these webinars this webinar and i would like also to thank the audience for uh, participating and also i would like to ask something to the audience um if you if there is uh, some topic or something that you uh, uh, find especially interesting especially um uh, you know that that is of much interest to you uh, Please let me know. Let let us know. We are doing the webinar calendar for next year, and uh, uh, we are doing. Sometimes we issue uh, surveys, but uh, uh, 
also the, the number of uh, uh, answers is not uh, so high. So uh, if you have suggestions for webinars, for topics, or even for uh, speakers that you, you've heard at a yeah, conference or something and you find interesting, please uh, let us know because we want to do webinars that are interesting for you. Uh, so uh, please, my email. Uh, well, you can you can use any uh, of the emails at PCMI website, or you can use uh, my email. You, you that is a n a l i c e at d s i dot u m i n h o dot p t and please send suggestions i i will and dcmi will appreciate very much thank you and uh, have nice holidays seasons thank you anna branca and joe for today's aces and dcmi joint webinar for those still here the webinar was recorded and will be made available to you within 48 hours of today's broadcast. Um, once again, thank you and happy holidays to everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye, bye, thank you.